Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Talk About Script podcast. This one entitled Crying to Taylor Swift in the Car. I am Gareth Chappell, and with me, as always, keeping it super profesh, is Charlie Carthy. And joining us this week is the one known as Ali, fresh from drinking spicy margaritas and making very, very bad decisions. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Right, so our theme this week is going to be mainly lighting. We're going to talk about Fall Guy, we're going to move on to Kodachrome, and then a little bit on Scott Pilgrim. So, moving straight on, I'll start with you, Charlie. So, first of all, give me your impressions of Fall Guy. Fall Guy. Um, ne- I have not had that much fun in a, uh, in a cinema watching a film in a long time. It was um, lit beautifully everyone in gold and even more gold uh, in the film within the film um and yeah I, I was losing track of how many films and director and art styles it was riffing on i don't want to say parodying but it wasn't quite paying homage to we'll uh, um, we'll go in we'll go into the uh that there is one particular but, film that it does quite heavily rip off <laughs> well not rip off but riff on Brilliantly. Imagine if that film's director just turned the colour temperature palette all the way from his chosen colour to the other end of the slider, and that's the film Emily Blunt's making in the movie, and it looks incredible. Mm. Ali, thoughts? Well, I thought I'd be there to see Emily Blunt and Aaron Taylor-Johnson, but I left the cinema being Team Gosling all the way. He's never looked so good. (laughs) Um, It was a great film. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I say that about a lot of films, but Fall Guy, I think especially, it was just oh, chef's kiss. We have to say, we're not, we're not here to uh, to judge how the stars look, but I think every time we say the word Emily Blunt, we have to follow it with this. I mean, unbelievable. I think I don't think she's ever looked better. Um, so first of all, for those of you who haven't seen Fall Guy yet, it is about a stuntman, played by Ryan Gosling, who ends up injuring himself badly in in some way and losing the then love of his life Jodie Moreno played by Emily Blunt um, who then is mysteriously contacted and drafted back onto set uh, for a uh, a film that Blunt is now directing um, and then stuff happens which we we're not going to try and spoil it uh, too much I mean there's not a massive amount of twists here uh, but we'd, it is a, a good time so I think it's very David Leach. Um, So I know, Charlie, you've seen Bullet Train. Yeah, big enjoyment of Bullet Train. Um, Bullet Train and Deadpool 2, like those films. It's fun, it's fast, um, full of kinetic energy, but none of it, like, it doesn't go too far with it. It's not just action. Like, you know, it's about Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt Even the romantic tension as he comes back into the movie and will they, won't they get back together? They get through that pretty quickly. And then it's like, (laughs) how do we save this movie that, um, that she's making? How does he, how can he become the hero of that story? Yeah. Um, Originally we were going to talk about drive here as well because of the whole being a real hero thing, but it really doesn't fit. So we've we've pivoted to Scott Pilgrim. So uh, it's a much better fit. We came out of that cinema saying one word. We did. Ali, what word was that? Can you remember? <laughs> Charlie. I don't know. I said a lot of words about that film. <laughs> Charlie. Postmodernism. Postmodernism, indeed. Um, Ali, have you seen Bullet Train as well, right? I have, yes. Yeah. Now, we've all seen Bullet Train here. I thought Bullet Train was too long and a little bit overdone, and the special effects were a bit naff. Um, I can't say that about Fall Guy. So what did you feel like with regards to Bullet Train? How, how did Fall Guy shape up for you? They're obviously very completely different films, but like I get what you mean with the special effects not being all that, um, especially when you're outside of the train, because realistically you are not going to be able to jump up onto that train. Um, but I think for me, like the entertainment value, it was definitely way better with Full Guy than it was with Bullet Train. I felt more um, like hooked into Full Guy, and it wasn't just because of Ryan Gosling's beautiful face. Um, or, or, em- hang on. or Emily Blunt's beautiful or, face. Let me Emily just Blunt's. add balance here. Mm. Yeah. So, what about what about Aaron Taylor Johnson's beautiful face? Who have. was Stop in both? It. I love Aaron Taylor Johnson. <laughs> Despite the fact he was doing his best, I'm really trying to look like Logan Paul. 
<laughs> impression sound, during that film. And sound like Matthew McConaughey. And being a massive douche, which he did really well. I think he just does that ev- very well in every film that he's in. Yeah. And I think it just works for him and works <laughs> for his face. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I think this is Leech's masterpiece, mm. I have to say. Uh, as much as I like Deadpool and obviously the chore- he was, you know, he's involved with choreography and production of John Wick and all that, but that's kind of, he's not directed those. Um, so I didn't know this, but Leach is a stunt choreographer. Mm. And here we basically have a movie which is celebrating stuntmen. So um, I hate CGI, as I think I've mentioned on the previous podcast, but the stuff that they actually put the actors through in this is incredible. Um People looking for like real special effects. That this is the film to go to. I mean, what did what did you think, Charlie? Um, they do have. Is it spoiler to talk about what they play during the credits? Oh, I think we can talk about them. Yeah. Music. So, um, no, it's more the B roll that they show as the credits are playing of the stunts actually happening, and it was amazing. Like how many of them I thought were. VFX or mm. put in some in front of some virtual production or you know some crash that would have been happening where they don't have real glass exploding everywhere and real cars tipping over um but it was amazing to see the actual stunt guys doing it and clearly like putting that after the end of the movie is Leech's um very clear messaging to people that yeah these are what's real stunt guys do in a movie about a stunt guy it's a very, um, I mean, it's not subtle when he literally turns around and goes, nope, there's no, there's no Oscars given for stuntmen. And the fact that the stunt crew um, led by, I loved um, Winston Duke as the stunt coordinator character in the film, um, but how all the stunt team become the heroes led by Gosling. Um, that's, that was an amazing moment. It's um, almost like they're looking up to him. Yeah. <laughs> some kind of superhero type leader this was a, well, another I, discussion we had yeah, <laughs> that was yeah have you settled on that is that the genre that this is yes because I mean, we were debating this um for a good while after coming out of the cinema well i'll throw this over to ali so that just just from the simple point of view you don't need to, don't worry you don't need to be deep in our genre well okay, cool. i'm just going to throw this over to you did he seem like a normal guy to you or was he more like a guy with really super skills? I mean, at first for me, it was he seemed like a normal guy. And then when we started getting into the more of the action kind of scenes, he did seem like like there were moments in my brain where I was like, oh, my God, he's actually really skilled at this. Mm-hmm. But like, there was no super kind of skills here. This is all just stuff he could have learned as a stunt man. Yeah, but I think he's above the normal man. I think oh, so. Absolutely. So we were arguing, well, you know, this is very Blakey and Blake Snyder Ian. Uh, we were arguing whether this was like your dude of a problem, the ordinary guy in an extraordinary situation kind of movie. You know, your diehards, your Martians, things like that. Uh, but I think we settled on that it was more like the superhero thing where you're, you're so good at something, people are jealous of you, and then you kind of you you raise up the ordinary man who then kind of looks up to you. I mean, the reason he gets injured in the first place is is kind of based in that. We won't go into the super details of that. But yeah, so I think it's very Leechian if you look at his other movies. You know, Deadpool, obviously. and Well, all of his movies have all been of, all of his super, movies. super hero. <laughs> Even John Wick. Yeah, John yeah, Wick, it's Atomic Blonde. Yes, um, so it, it it's not a massive stretch. It's just not the, the Marvel superhero vibe. Uh, it's more like the Robin Hood, the Gladiator, the, the that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, briefly on that, it it, it is that kind of film. Um, but it is oh my god, it is such a good time, isn't it? Um, I think the stunts, not being CGI outside of the movie, which is quite clever, the movie within the movie, um, just does give it that visceral, real feeling to it, and they're spectacular as well. Like, and they come to mind. For me, it was when uh, um, Gosling and one of the my favorite character in it, Jean Paul, Jean Paul, um, yeah, are climbing from the truck to the skip that's on the back of the truck they're chasing, oh, and yeah. fighting the guys, the the two goons in the skip, and in from the uh, back of the cab of that truck, um, while glass is shattering, they're crashing through the streets. And that was one of the first ones they've showed during the credits of, hey, this was, they actually did this. They actually dragged this thing through the streets of Sydney. 
Um, yeah. With I, guys inside beating each other up. I am amazed that that was not done virtually. I am absolutely stunned that no one died. Uh, that is like proper 19, ni- mid 80s Hong Kong, you know, no health and safety Hong Kong movie <laughs> the kind, choreography. The, the kind that you'd see Michelle Yeoh in. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm sure we'll come on to Mel- Michelle Yeoh at some point in the future. It seems inevitable. But yeah. What Ali, you, Al? can you think of any? I, I mean, I liked all the stunts, but there was like, you know, when he's constantly being thrown onto the rock. Yeah. I think that was my favorite. That's amazing very comedic the uh the 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 relationship workout scene mm. which i believe ends with one of the best and most disturbing quotes i've ever heard with emily blunt referring to our love life of that being like a sushi carousel <laughs> um yeah uh one of the greatest lines ever committed to film uh ladies and gentlemen it's a uh, it's a special moment for everyone involved but yeah it's even that just shows you how dangerous such a, a seemingly repeated shot is um yeah so we had a good time i mean so we were looking at this in terms of how it could be useful to people as we always do because you know we're incapable of just sitting and enjoying something um and i mean the script is okay the characters are okay it's all kind of played for laughs and it it works but it it's written in such a way that it's quite ironic and quite self-knowing and all that kind of stuff. So really, what really is the highlight here, I think, is the lighting, I think, is what we identified on. I mean, let, let us not forget Emily Blunt. Whoever whoever did her lighting should follow her around for life, I, I would say. You, t- they, you There was a point in the cinema, you turned to me and were just saying, she lit from the side, side <laughs> profile. It's amazing. She's lit from the side. They're doing it again. Yeah. Um, um, I first noticed it, like thinking back, it was that moment that is the title of this episode um, when they're sitting in the car listening to Taylor Swift. Um, and we see both Gosling and Emily Blunt have this, yeah, this side profile lighting. Um, yeah. And it just makes a beautiful glow around. around I, I'm going to, I'm going to ruin everyone who's listening's lives right now. Okay, this has happened since I watched Batman. There is now a thing where what you do is you light you light the subject from the side, so it creates light a, a really nice light on one side and depth of field on the other. And now every film that I've watched where they're trying to make the female character seem like I don't know otherworldly beautiful, they're using this technique. I can't I can't unsee it now. <laughs> It's almost as if they're trying to create this silhouette, but glowing instead yeah. of dark. Yeah, it all started with Zoe Kravitz's shoulders, and now we've just gone crazy. <laughs> and he does it, we'll talk about Kodachrome, he does exactly the same thing, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, yeah, lighting is awesome. Um, and the general transitioning and editing, there's some really clever stuff like split screening, which works really well. Yeah, I don't know about that, Gareth, whether it has a place in... <laughs> <laughs> hmm creative transitions yeah so it, it it's very meta this film not in a deadpool way uh but it's very much like walk when they're doing the split screen for instance they're walking around going hey do you think split screen's a cliche in a movie does it really work and it's the sort of thing that if the wrong director was involved would not work there's there's so much metering oh this film's got a third act problem and all this how do we solve a third act problem and so many callbacks and the whole thing with ryan gosling's cup of coffee which just disappears after a while um I, I don't know. I, I've never seen Leech be so restrained in a way, and I think that's why it works. If you'd gone full Deadpool or full Bullet Train, God forbid, um, the film would have just been overblown, self-indulgent. But it's not. It's like a celebration of what we love about cinema. Um, and I think also those of you who watch film and have watched film for a long time will get a lot out of it because of the constant references and postmodernism. Um, I've seen a lot of reviews that which have dared to give this like three out of five stars. I'm just like, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. Yeah. What would? Yeah, because we went in cut sort of blind, thinking you mentioned that we were going to talk about Drive with this, and thinking it was going to be another one of those kind of films, just a bit sillier. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think it was the part, it, the fact that they have their like there's so much intertextuality throughout this film and referencing and homaging and just um parodying um other films and other 
director styles, what? not naming names of whose, but we'll, those we'll who have do seen that in a minute. It, okay, I'll name it in a minute. <laughs> yeah, um, but well, there's there's multiple, but there's multiple yeah. films that it very clearly well, um, has a dig at um, in the most hilarious way that is not actually punching downwards, which speaks to that restraint that you were talking about. I mean, I think there's one film which it kind of lovingly pokes fun at, yeah. and then there's one film which it doesn't <laughs> um before we get into that though i just i just stumbled across the the link um so what's he called tom Ryder? is that aaron taylor johnson's character yeah so clearly meant to be uh tom cruise oh. and um which is interesting well what's interesting is there's a little bit of video out there with uh from live die repeat of where Emily Blunt absolutely uh, verbally eviscerates Tom Cruise on set because he's acting like a dick. And I just, I just, the synergy of her being the director of uh, a movie where she can't control the star that's based on Tom Cruise is, is kind of interesting. But it's, again, it's a nice little uh, homaging to, uh, to real life. Uh, never mess with Emily Blunt, by the way. If you've seen that video, oh my God. She does not take any prisoners. Um, but so if we get into these movies, like the postmodernism aspects of this, the movies that we're referencing, did you pick them up, Ali? Oh, well, there was definitely references to Dune. I mean, that's the loving one. And I found that absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Um, um, I don't think I picked up on a lot of them. That's, I mean, Dune is the main one done with love and care yeah. and like jumping onto the, and just playing the soundtrack from Dune. Also, we have when... Uh, Gosling's getting out of the water. You get the uh, the Daniel Craig oh, yeah. Bond's music, which is hilarious. But um, the movie which it doesn't treat so carefully is Charlie Rebel Moon. Rebel Moon. Rebel Moon and oh, Zack my. Snyder just at the end, very overtly, <laughs> as it starts to show the film within the film. Um, I mentioned the color palette and the way it's lit before. Um, Snyder tends to have a just turns everything blue in his older <laughs> films, either blue, very, very blue, or in films like 300 and Rebel Moon, very, very gold. Doesn't he subtle, does he, Mr. Um, Snyder? Yeah, there's no there's no like middle ground in a color temperature slider. It's just one way or the other. Um, and this is very obviously Rebel Moon as they show oh, the you know, the actors swinging their prop swords around the space cowboys, the space cowboys fighting the aliens as the, and they start glowing and the very, very amazing cameo. Oh, yeah, I think we'll leave that one. Yeah. But, yeah, but, uh, but also the, uh, the 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 swords that they're swinging around are like electric guitars. <laughs> Absolute genius. Uh, yeah, it doesn't treat Rebel Mean with uh, as much care and attention as something like Gene. But, you know, we've all seen Rebel Mean doesn't deserve to be treated with any form of care and attention absolutely dreadful film um so yeah it's filled with postmodernism. it's got beautiful beautiful lighting um the colors are really nice as well um but little leech's films bullet train has got really nice color not even i can moan about that as much as i think the film is a little bit you know um but it it's this is the right length it's the right pace it's the right structure i i anyone who comes out of the cinema who doesn't enjoy themselves i think really needs to have a look at them look at their life um, <laughs> and, um and what they're trying to get out of the cinematic experience yeah normally in a cinema i'm one of those people that kind of likes to just shut up and watch the movie this time we were all just howling with laughter yep. by the end and if people around us weren't it was begging that question of why, why? Do you go yeah what are you going here for I think there were a lot of people in the cinema that definitely weren't laughing well, <laughs> they were definitely the loudest i almost gave it a standing ovation at one point not at the end of just the, there's a bit that happens which is so cliched and i was like no they're not going to keep turning it up and up and up on how silly this is and they do and they do and they do and then the moment happens and i was like that that's like standing ovation well done you went there and you pulled it off brilliant absolutely brilliant uh there's also obviously riffing on mad max as well i should add but everyone riffs on so does it even count anymore but yeah um go for the stunts admire the lighting look at the creative editing and stare longingly at ryan gosling and emily blunt in the heavily on the right he well i mean you're wrong but you know there we go um and yeah it, it, they've never looked better i don't think i mean the film is awesome i'm definitely gonna be watching it again Oh, absolutely. I, I might even go again this week. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I was goes. very tempted this weekend. 
Yeah. I, I haven't had so much fun in the cinema. I can't even think the last film I came out of. Across the Spider-Verse, maybe. But not in the same way. I, that was just like, oh my God, I'm adrenaline fueled. But this was just like such a good time. I, not I, even when we saw Kung Fu Panda 4? I mean, no. As much as that had um, K, that had K Kwan on it, but I, I, I mean, no, the Marvels was a good time. Don't at me, um, but not in the same league. I, I honestly can't think. I'm trying to think. Probably, probably Endgame. I'm going to yeah. say it. Really? Probably Endgame. I yeah. think it's that long ago that I had such an actual good time in the cinema. Yeah, because we've seen films, um, probably like Godzilla, that left us like yeah. stunned emotionally um, complex and like we felt it but for a film that we actively you know laugh out loud wanting to cheer for like like you said wanting to give a standing ovation for um yeah there hasn't been a moment like that since since endgame yeah i think i'd say across the spider verse for me i know you disagree very wrongly charlie we're not gonna get into uh, that. that's that's another podcast charlie's insane thoughts about the cross spider verse I'd like um, to join that one. <laughs> but yeah, me. I am I am just racking my brain to think if there's anything else I've seen which was such a feel good film and I I don't think it I don't think I have. Um moving on. Okay. So as we move into the more educational side of the podcast, um we're going to start with our underrated movie uh which I forced my two co-hosts here to go and watch uh i don't actually know ali's opinion on it i know what charlie's is but buried on netflix funnily enough there's a there's a pattern here way back in 2016 it's not even had a dvd release and it's not been on terrestrial television is a film called kodachrome uh kodachrome stars jason sudeikis or ted lasso as he's otherwise known uh ed harris and elizabeth olsen otherwise known as scarlet witch uh, in her day-to-day -day life. And it's basically the story of um, a estranged son and father who undertake a road trip to get uh, some reels of film developed uh, at the last place in the country, which is developing Kodachrome because the dye is running out. And just to add a bit of emotional weight, the dad is also dying. Oh, no. Um, but it's actually quite a sweet film. Uh, so I quite like this film. I think it's underrated. It's quite an easy watch. I've seen it a few times. Um, so first of all, Ali, thoughts? Well, okay. Oh um, dear. I would agree with you when you say it's an easy watch because I it was it was easy. I didn't really have to think. I didn't have to focus that much. Um, I didn't think it was a sweet movie. Oh, interesting. Um. I feel like some parts were a little bit rushed and then I, I like especially at the at the end where everything am I allowed to spoil? I mean it's been out for a few years, isn't it? I mean it's twenty sixteen, I think you're safe. I can play the spoiler horn. That there you go. A spoiler warning. Yeah. Um I just didn't really like at the end when like after I can't remember the characters' names, Elizabeth uh quits oh. um and then she she goes off. See I, I can I'm remembering this because I was what I was playing Power Wash Simulator at the same time. <laughs> Dedication to the podcast, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I can multitask really well. By the way, shout out to Future Lab, the very talented developers of Power Wash Simulator. Absolutely. <laughs> They're great. Um, and then all of a sudden he's in the hospital and uh, I don't know, boy, his name's Ben. What's the main guy's name? Jason Sudeikis. I never remember. Oh, okay. Name. Jason Sudeikis. <laughs> so he, the son, he's the son, Matt. Oh, yeah. Matt. Ed, Matt. That's yeah. it. There you Sorry. Go. Ed Harris so, being the dad, Ben. Yeah, although Ben. The one that Matt, that the son never calls dad, but just calls him Ben. Yeah. See, that's what I didn't really like at the end. Like all of it, like he's dying. We know that. And then he's been told by the hospital staff he's not going to make it to kansas he won't even make it to new york and then all of a sudden he's calling him dad uh, and he's, he's in the hotel room and he's like what should we do for dinner and then like i mean it was kind of emotional um and quite sad to see like how quick it happened for ben mm. but then like i feel like the ending would have had more emotion like hit the audience more if we didn't see that moment where Matt decides that Ben is actually like his dad. I see what you're saying. 
Um, I think as we're in this golden fleecy realm, I think really Ben's role really is just to draw the other two characters together. Yeah. Um, and I he think he directly calls it out. Like, yeah. I in mean, the first third. Yeah. And I, I think Charlie, I'll come to you for your thoughts on the film generally in a minute. But I think I think the um, that kind of ending sequence is really just about Jason Sudeikis' characters, Matt, uh, just letting it go, like actually saying enough is enough. Uh, just like, as kind of syner- synergizing with uh, Elizabeth Olsen's character of sometimes you just got to let the baggage go uh, to move forward. I think that kind of what they're going through but i do i do what you come from especially if you know what the ending is um mm. when the, the film is developed i mean it's not gonna be a massive shot to people but uh charlie first time viewer thoughts um yeah really enjoyed it nice easy watch i initially was gonna put it on in the background and then it very very quickly gripped me i, I could not do anything else i can't imagine why that would be charlie yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah again we'll save that that's not even the other podcast material <laughs> but it was very quickly gripping um really got into it um yeah uh very easily a golden fleece movie love the journey love the music yeah you know? it's it's and the linking of music into the the mo- the special moments in lives and connection yeah. with characters is quite cool Cool guy does that as well, by the way. Yeah, um, <laughs> that was the that was that was the part that really like surprisingly grabbed me. Um, when you when you suggested that uh, we watch this movie and talk about it, there was a point that you mentioned, Gareth, that you wanted to cover about lighting. Yeah. So the reason, because we were coming off full guy with lighting and and the cross lighting, that that Craig the Crane does something really clever and. He, this is one of those things where you go on the internet, there's nothing written about it, so you have to use your own brain to work this one out. Um, basically, Elizabeth Olsen's character, who is kind of the nurse stroke personal assistant of uh, Ben, who's dying. The main character, Jason Stecker's character, is kind of really cynical, and he's coming off a divorce, and, uh, you know, they're both broken, basically. Surprise, surprise. Golden Fleas, broken characters going on a long journey. What's going to happen? Um, but... Obviously, as Elizabeth Olsen's character and Matt get to know each other better, his thoughts about her begin to change. And what they do is they change her lighting. So what you'll get is something that only happens when the two of them are together. They will turn and look at, or he will turn and look at her, and then you will get a shot of Olsen framed beautifully, almost like a photograph. Uh, and they'll gradually change the lighting. So it starts out quite distant and quite kind of formal. I think they first it's meet in the diner. It's very, um, well, not even in the office, when yeah. they first meet, everything's very muted, everything neutral. And then as they start the journey, um, start to, you know, make their stops at a diner, at a family, at a relative's place, um, and then going on to a music gig. Um they go from neutral to like this beautiful dark and golden color that's very fairy tale like here, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of like that he, he goes into the, the kind of uh kind of uh vibe for a little bit. Um I will agree with Ali about things being rushed. I thought that was very quick. Um when he just starts o- very openly declaring that he's that he's falling for her. Um, mm. Mm. Well, maybe that, not in those words, but it kind of just starts like when they're at um, the uncle's house, Matt's uncle's house, Ben's brother, when um, like he starts drinking, and then um, Elizabeth Olsen is in her in his mm. old room in his bed, and he comes in all drunk. And he's like, my aunt thinks you're beautiful. I mean, nothing's more attractive yeah. than the drunk guy, is it? <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> but. Even that felt a bit weird. Like I, I, I paused Power Wash Simulator. I was like, what is going on here? Why is this happening now? It doesn't like, really though, does it? He ends up like It takes it yeah, it it falls it, on it, the floor. It takes so. the um you know, the, the second third of the movie for this to for them, you know, yeah, you have for it to, to actually happen. Elizabeth Olsen has to get her demons out first before yeah. so they both fully are aware of each other's baggage and damage. And he has to as she calls out, has to let his guard down. Exactly. Um, but yeah, by that point, that's when, uh, the note I wrote to Gareth was, goes from neutral to gold to glistening to cold. Yeah. Um, and it's that point when, you know, in that second third, when they finally are, you know, when she's let her demons go and they start, um, embracing their feelings and each other. Um, 
that yeah that's where we see that glistening light you know he t- as he said he turns to look at her she's got this side profile lighting on the yeah. side of her face that gives this shimmer um mixed in with more warm colors and goldness and um lots of small lights in the background out of focus making that beautiful bokeh um it's almost as if yeah this was framed for photographers yeah i i think it's interesting well when they kind of um meet up at the end of the film a lot of the glow has kind of gone uh so it's almost like they're looking at each other they've they've kind of he's kind of looking at her like oh you're the answer to everything um but then by the end of it it's like he's still they're still attracted to each other even though they now see each other outside of the fairy tale which i think is more important for the kind of longevity of the film so it's like hey i understand we're both damaged let's work through this as opposed to the like oh Scarlet Witch is hitting on me, <laughs> kind of vibe. Um, so that only works if you're saying it in Ted Lasso's accent. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, a man of my age, Elizabeth Olsen, doesn't do an awful lot for, but I, I understand that she might be, uh, she might be described yeah. as pretty in a conventional <laughs> sense. Um, is that is that is that one of the lines that Ed Harris says? <laughs> yeah, something um, like that. Yeah, but, but it, it it is a. It's beautifully underrated from a, a framing and lighting point of view. I just kind of sure. snuck on to Netflix. Um, um, I was absolutely stunned that I hadn't heard of, even heard of this film before. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. yeah, I go digging. I find Light. these things. But yeah, a film about family, you know, bonding, falling in love, photography with music and beautiful lighting. Like that's all my algorithm ticks. Yeah. And it never came up. So you can add this to uh, Love and Monsters from uh, last week and um, put it on your list of films that you're never actually going to watch, but probably should. So yeah, um, Coda Chrome, it's on Netflix. Um, Ali didn't love it. but I didn't know. But, you know, you can't please Ali sometimes. So there you go. Um, yeah. Yeah, from a, I mean, it's not, look, it's not perfect. It's probably one of, the, what I would describe it as is probably one of the best seven out of 10 films you're going to watch. That would be my kind of description of it. <laughs> People don't know what I mean. You can, not as we said before, not every film can be a 10 out of 10 masterpiece. It, um, was, it was time efficient. I mean, it was. So it's only, what, an hour and a half? Maybe an hour 40? Yeah, um, it's, it's exactly the right length. Yeah. Um, and the road trip's cool, and it's got some nice music in it, and everything looks pretty. And it's helpful to you. So there you go. Um, okay, moving on. So... Uh, we had to pivot quite dramatically. So the final the final film we were originally going to be talking about was Drive because, you know, lighting, editing, cinematography, not Ryan being Gosling. the real hit, Ryan, Ryan Gosling, not being the real hero, Carrie Mulligan, etc. fits in with the actress uh, kind of profile. However, there is absolutely no way in whatever tonal way possible that we could link Full Guy to Drive. So we have pivoted to... Uh, a very different film in Scott Pilgrim versus the world. So I think it's only fair this as this is Charlie's favorite film ever. Uh, yeah, it is. It is one of my go to's that I never get sick of. Always makes me feel good. That will give Charlie some time without interrupting him to explain why he likes Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Go. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I love that this was the choice because it's full of postmodernism, just like Fall Guy was with the way that Fall Guy pays tribute and homage to films scott pilgrim does to video games and video games of my kind of era and yours well bit, gareth as well i don't know do we want to what final fantasy well super nintendo is definitely my yeah era. um but that legend of zelda i love that the great fairy music plays when ramona is literally skating through scott's dreams and he's searching for her um final mm. fantasy final dream, fantasy music d- dream girls interesting yeah. another link Lots of, um, lots of the, all the actresses being shown in lovely lights and dreamy <laughs> situations before crushing reality. Hits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And um, yeah, actual video game references in the framing, um, in the editing. Edgar Wright is just so good with creative transitions that are packed full of energy. Um, kind uh, of in a, in, a, in, a, in a similar energy that David Leach yeah um i think we'll talk about transitions a little bit more uh in a minute because that's one of the key takeaways from scott pilgrim um i just let's establish each other's era so charlie you're what super nintendo era or Uh, playstation era playstation playstation so i don't want to age myself boys and girls but really i'm the amstrad era 
Um, and Ali would probably be. I'm going to guess. Let's and just say, say this: I was that I was born the same year the PlayStation Two came out. I mean, it's ridiculous, boys and girls. What is happening? You know, these Gen Zs. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of pre-console, which is a shocking thought. Um, yes. Anyway. How um, was it to live in black and white? Uh, it wasn't black and white, it was black and green. That, <laughs> that's that's what it was. Okay. Um, the mighty Amstrad shall rise again. Make it, make it happen, Lord Sugar. Um, okay, so as we all recover from that revelation... So Charlie was mentioning the transitions there. Um, Fall Guy does this as well, but uh, Scott, in all honesty, Scott Pilgrim does it better. Um, so Scott Pilgrim does this thing where it tries to make itself move like an actual comic book, and it does that with the creative transition. So it does things where uh, you get kind of swipes to sound, you get split screens, you get... You get well, camera move turning into split screen and then out of split screen that moves with the second screen that's wiping in. Yeah, it's um, mad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, creative use of split screening, like you said, to look like a comic book. Um, but also it plays on the, I guess, the the use of split screen as a separation and then yeah. shows, actually, they're not separated. She's right outside the door. Yeah, you um, just shouldn't let her in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take the window out instead. Um, what I think... <laughs> I, I should, Ali, was this your first view of this, Scott Pilgrim? This was my first time watching oh, Scott Pilgrim. Oh, my word. I will say, though, I have seen lots of clips of it on Instagram and TikTok without actually realising that it was Scott Pilgrim. Oh, my God. Especially when Knives is at the door. Instagram and TikTok. This is what our movies have been reduced to, boys and girls. I think it's actually a great way to see films because you see a clip on TikTok or Instagram and you're intrigued by, what, by what, like, what's going on. And then you look mm. in the comments and then they're like, what film is it? There are literally editors and people who uh, design the rhythm and flow of their films spinning in their graves that they haven't even died into yet on, on that. I mean, it maybe works as a trailer. But yeah. Um, anyway, Ali, what did you think of it? Did you get the references or are you too damn young? Well. Oh, dear. I can sense friction. <laughs> Keep going, this is, uh, I remind everyone, this is Charlie's favorite film ever. Ali, honest opinion? Honest opinion. I actually enjoyed the film. Oh, thank God. Yes. I didn't get a lot of the references. I was probably only 10 when it came out. Um, so there was definitely... I, I've never played Final Fantasy. I don't know what um, what sounds they might have used. I really like the fight sequences, though. Yeah. That was really cool. What was your favourite? Favourite moment or least favourite battle? My favourite battle, I think, was um, against Veganator. That one... <laughs> That one was definitely my favorite. Superman. Because uh, he was so just super. so easily destroyed. Least favorite moment. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like the whole relationship thing with Knives was kind of weird. Like, <laughs> Knives is 17. That's like... Uh, yeah. Like, I'm... I'm I, no. Yeah. <laughs> I just can't put it into words. Like, I, don't, I just didn't really like it. I think I spent a lot of the first, um, like few moments of that film grimacing at my screen yeah but also <laughs> that is the you yeah. know the appropriate kind of response that comes from any normal person of wait scott pilgrim is dating a high schooler mm. i mean that even the characters in there are yeah. like saying hey i mean they don't even they've hold hand once i think is the, is the key to oh it, yeah i think yeah. the most they've done is um knives has kissed scott on the cheek but i think yeah. my favorite my favorite knives scene is um she only likes it because she's old. Yeah, like that, Knives is a badass. Yeah. Knives is an absolute badass and can clearly do better, just doesn't realise it. Mm. And Well, she does by the end of the movie. Well, exactly. Yeah, literally saying, I'm too cool for you anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we all, we all know what the actual best moment of the film is, which is obviously the Brie Larson cover of, of Black Sheep. That is the best cover of that song I um, have ever heard. It is currently in my Spotify playlist. And I would just like to reiterate the fact she sang it herself. And, well, wouldn't you say, Gareth, your favourite moment is the one that didn't make it into the film? Oh, what, when she falls off the stage? Yeah. It was um, uh, Captain Marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. No, and, she really hurt herself. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not, we're, not, we're not condoning actors getting hurt in any way or performers getting hurt, but that was quite funny. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think she actually got really hurt there, yeah. so we shouldn't because <laughs> she's on like eight inch heels or something. Jesus but Christ. yeah, yeah, but she was, but she was brilliant as uh, Envy. Is it Envy? Yeah, Adams. yeah, yeah. The um, you should know that Charlie, if this I is your should, favorite yeah. film. I should, but she was not the girl that I was paying attention to. I mean, Ramona. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, more, Ramona's more my age range. Jeez, but um, yeah, I mean, best one of the best cameos I think in a. Yeah, in a, in a show. between between her and um, I'm with you, Ali, about the best battle against uh, Todd. Mm. Uh, yeah, the base yeah. battle um, with the flying cups fl- <laughs> flying towards Scott like a, like particles in a Final Fantasy game, um, while his glowing vegan superpowers help him play bass. Yeah, um, absolutely incredible. And the fact that it was Brandon Routh in it is is such a great cameo. I just have um, to ask you one thing, Charlie. Is that the reason why you became a vegan? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was not the re- it was not the reason I became a vegan. Um, and when I stopped, I I seemingly gained back my regular human powers. Yeah, Ch- C- C- Charlie Jane gained the power of nutrition. Yes, I gained the power <laughs> of sleeping properly. <laughs> Charlie gained the power of good blood sugar. Um, yeah. That's a whole other podcast, Charlie's journey back to uh, back to back, back to college, back to, <laughs> back to nutritious health. <laughs> yeah. After uh, yeah, but um, yeah, so being vegan didn't actually give me superpowers, unlike Brandon Routh. I think that is just from being Superman. Um, yeah. Anyway, I feel like we've uh, yeah sidetracked terms, ourselves here. Yeah, getting back to the point, um, the lighting in that is is great. Um, like I said, I love the light flashing in it. I loved the use of the wing cannon to move all the cups around like light particles in a game. Um, same with the stage show, the battle against the Katianagi twins. It is amazing. Also, we should say, I mean, in contrast to Full Guy, if you want to see how Full Guy is very practical in its VFX, Scott Pilgrim is all CGI and CGI done well. Yeah. So CGI that I enjoy because it's supposed to be a comic, not like just randomly. I'm looking at you, Zach Sider. Randomly it's kind a- of... It's not a comic trying to be reality. Yeah. It's a live action film that is a comic book. And it's just embracing that the fact that it's a comic book and also a comic book and a story embracing video games. So even the VFX that looks, you know, it looks like it's from a game, It whether it's from, you know, uh, something from console era or it's got like 16 bit to it yeah um you know scott's extra life the swords that he unleashes or is it um gideon's one that has the pixels um, oh um the, uh, the glowing pixel edges and also it's um, the sword for final Fantasy 7 isn't it the sword that he has it's uh sephiroth's sword oh yeah the, yeah the 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 long katana yeah yeah but um yeah the fact that it wears that on its sleeve um frames the two com- two opponents or you know in some cases the bat you know the battling bands from the side in a w- nice wide two shot you know almost like every single fighting game frames its characters yeah i mean in terms of creative transitions and framing scott pilgrim is one of the best ones out there um so you know full guy's got the lighting going on kodachrome's definitely got lighting going on but scott pilgrim in terms of how to use you know edgar wright is the master of this baby driver is pretty good at this as well uh, but like Scott Pilgrim is next level in using transitions as storytelling device um, rather than just getting from one place to another. Um, challenge for the boys and girls out there, watch Kaylee Chrome and watch Scott Pilgrim and realize they're both the same genre. <laughs> they're the same film, both golden fleeces. Uh, one's slightly more epic than the other, but they are both fleeces. So there you go. Charlie's looking at me. He's not no, a I'm super. Like- He's literally called Scott Pilgrim. Yeah, <laughs> they literally say a pilgrim has to end his journey. No matter how many times I hear this or think about it, it still surprises me. Oh yeah, he's a pilgrim. He's a pilgrim. She's the prize, but he learns self-respect along there the way go. by literally getting on with his evil self. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't win her. He wins self-respect. So there you go. And then the two damaged people go off together, and knives is free of her abusive relationship that's that's the real story yeah <laughs> that is the real story you could put it that way yeah sure. yeah you, <laughs> the two absolute sociopaths go off together to be kind of all arrogant somewhere else um any thoughts on the soundtrack for it as well i mentioned i talked about the <laughs> use of video game music but what about like the actual soundtrack because that was something kodachrome had uh, you know did use yeah. well as well 
I mean, sounds most of the sound, the band itself, the songs are awesome, of course, in their in their own way. Um, yeah, the soundtrack for all three films is is. I mean, Fall Guy does that really clever thing where it starts using actual pop songs as part of the score, which I don't actually remember hearing or seeing before. Maybe Leech has done it before, I don't know. But Thunderstruck is the score for about 20 minutes of that film, like underneath, without the lyrics playing. It is. Is it? Is it yeah. Thunderstruck? Uh, Not start, I no, Was Made For Love. It starts with Thunderstruck and then it moves on to I Was Made oh, For Love. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I haven't heard that anywhere else. Um Obviously, Cody Crane just has cool music playing. And Scott Pilgrim is awesome. There's all sorts of orchestral, pixely, synth stuff going on, isn't there? Yeah, but also just with good, good late 90s, early 2000s grunge music yep. written by Beck um, and then played by Beck over the credits. Art. Um, Beck the arty man. Yeah, the one who invents and transcends his own genres. Yeah, I have um, my own thoughts about Beck as well, but, you know. But, um, I'm unsurprised to find Charlie really likes Beck. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, and even using music as a superpower. Yeah. Um, yeah. Failing at first and then finding the strength in it with his bandmates at, on at least one extra occasion later on. Maybe yeah. two, if we're talking, if we're including the final boss battle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's all about it's all about you know him trying to be a better person and then he hasn't learned anything by the end of it but there you go it's i love this film as well it's almost in my top 10 movies i would say but having seen various others recently i think it's they've it's been nudged out but i i do really like scott pilgrim i think it works really well as that kind of comic comic character anyway um okay right i think we should round this up because time is ticking away so um We've learned that lighting and framing is good, boys and girls. And you should go and watch Full Guy in the cinema. And if you come out feeling miserable, well, I don't know what to do for you. Um, I don't know what our next podcast will be. I have a horrifying sense it might be Phantom Menace related, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, X-Men 97 is also on the horizon somewhere. And I'm sure we'll manage to get Drive in there at some point as well. Uh, so thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you want to get hold of us, we are on Instagram at Talk About Scripts and also on Twitter um, at, at Talk About Scripts. So questions, feedback, all of that stuff is good. Um, remember to leave reviews and all that kind of stuff that all those YouTube type people say to you. And we will see you next time. So thank you, Ali, for joining. You're very welcome. And thank you, Charlie, for You're joining. You're very welcome. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.